Check one, two. Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles with podcast number 169. Riley was so nice. I got to say, I happen to have like the best person that helps me do what I do. Without her, I couldn't do half of what I do or a third of what I do. And if I were honest about it, I couldn't do anything that I do without her. So thank you, Riley, for getting me prepared every time I sit down at my my desk. And uh, we have five questions for those of you that are listening. We have five questions sent in by real estate investors. We're going to try hard to answer them. I can't always answer them because sometimes I just don't know the answer. If I don't, I will let you know. If if I do or think I do, I will attempt. Remember to send your question to bsffacademy.com. And before we get started, a couple things, two or three or four or five things. Uh, It is, for me anyway, live time. It's like December 16th. We have um, a few more days before that great holiday. And then we have a few more days before that really, really great holiday, which is New Year's. And um, for those of you that have may have thought to stop your marketing, continue, please. December is a great month for calls. And it's also the month that we need to market to prime or January. If we stop marketing in December, our January is going to be kind of slow. A lot of people think, well, they can just, they'll do it in January. What they forget is that it takes time to get marketing in the mail. It takes time for that mail for the U.S. Postal Service to deliver it. And so if you started in January, you probably aren't going to have the reap or the rewards of, um, of starting until February. And then if you are a believer in touching, which I'm not necessarily a believer in touching, I do like touching, but not touching from a male perspective, then you absolutely know that you need to touch, 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 touch. If you use cluster marketing, you don't necessarily have to touch as much or the touching concept isn't as important because we're not branding with t- cluster marketing. Um, next thing we, oh, yellow letters, got to say, a really cool thing for 2016 and it is a platinum membership card so what that allows you to do or have is once you have the platinum membership card and it's 147 dollars is your orders all of your orders in 2016 will be at a 15 percent discount now why is that significant because that's typically the value that we put the sell item at and we don't have sales very often but when we have sales the prices are really really good and so you buy this card for $147, you get then the opportunity to, no matter when you order and throughout the year, uh, 15% off. And let's put it to dollars and cents and how many pieces, you know, pay you back kind of thing. You know, 15% of a thousand is $150. The card itself is 147. So the moment you spend $1,000 on an order, you would have saved $3. So you, sh- you should just buy the card. So go buy the card and on your orders in 2016, you'll be prepared to start saving 15%. It's kind of cool. And you can use that all the way up until the end of 2016 and, and save 15%. So naturally it doesn't apply to the sell items and that kind of stuff, but the sell items are already at the 15%. And so it's a really good way to have something that's always on sale. So kind of cool stuff. I've got a big announcement coming about podcasting. And um, I'm not going to share it today. I'm just going to tease you guys a little bit about it. But we're going to evolve into really cool stuff here at Buy, Sell, Fix, Flip. And um, just be ready for it when it comes. Some of you guys know and gals know that I took a break from my podcasting. I, re, um, I, I took care of myself, for lack of better ways of putting it, and took stuff off my plate that I didn't like doing, which was causing me issues. And um, I'm adding now a bigger plate to do things that I enjoy do, doing, and podcasting is one of them. And so I'm going to get a kick out of doing this new venture we're, we're going to, to start in 2016. Here we go with question number one. And remember, there are five questions. You have a question, send it to bsffacademy.com, and we'll get your question answered if I have an idea of the answer. Question number one, I've had a lead on a 10-acre property with an ugly, ugly house like knock down ugly. At what point should I consider marketing it as land or as a total rehab? I don't like knocking down prop or, or structures. And, and the reason I don't like doing it was when, when I'm a wholesaler, which means I want to buy it in as is and sell it in as is. 
And so knocking it down doesn't, doesn't, you know, in that model doesn't afford knocking down. The other thing is, is it's sometimes it's not economical to knock it down because, you know, one person's um, nightmare is another person's palace kind of thing. And, you know, if you look at OSB, which is a plywood kind of thing, and you go to Home Depot and you look for plywood and old, old school plywood is in layers, you know, and the more layers, the better the plywood and the thicker the plywood, the better the plywood. Well, then they come out, came out with this OSB, which is basically not sawdust like particle board, but chips of, of wood compressed together and they made osb which is a plywood now you use it on uh, sheeting of, of the roof under your uh, roofing material and so there's a perfect example of someone's you know crap and someone else made it into something great so don't tear something down because you may be tearing down somebody else's palace and though they can go in there and they can look at it and, you know a contractor and go in there and go hey you know it's a 650 square foot house it's leaning to the left quite a bit it's about ready to fall down. Don't walk into the house. They can take that 650 square feet, probably not have to pay impact fees. And if you've ever built anything or if you've ever pulled a permit, you'll know what impact fees are, uh, school fees, fees for the, the fire department, those kinds of things. Because the permit fee on a, on a new construction is relatively small. I mean, the permit, if you really look at the cost of the actual permit part of the permit fee, it's like a couple hundred bucks, three, four, five hundred bucks for plan check and that kind of stuff. It's all the school fees, the impact fees, the transportation fees, the sewer fees, all those other fees that go along with it that starts adding the thousands of dollars for, you know, that construction project. However, a lot of, a lot of places, a lot of counties allow you that when you have a structure on the property, if you if you tore that property, that structure down or started remodeling, that that square footage that you have there, you can that the that impact fee would be waived because it's just a remodel, it's not a new construction. And if if you did tear it down, then you had so many months to rehab it or I'm sorry, rebuild it from new. So if I wanted to go in there and and tear it down as an investor that does rehabbing or as a contractor that does new build, I could tear it down, but I just don't, if I do it within a, a certain period of time from my, of my permit, I'm not going to have to pay some of those impact fees, which are enormous. And a lot of times you'll find that the land value increases dramatically knowing what that time limit and that savings is. So that's one of the things that you'd want to school yourself on is go down to your, your county or your city building department and find out what that savings possibility is and what those rules and regu regulations are. Um, which is why, what, by the way, it's off topic, but it's also why fire damaged houses, if you're a rehabber or contractor investor kind of thing, those things are, are prime because man, first of all, you have all that insurance money, but then you don't have some of those impact fees and it's just great stuff. So at what point should you be marketing it? I would always market it if I, if. Let me back up at what, how should you market it? I would always market it as both the possibility of a house because it is a house currently, it may not be habitable or if it is habitable, if it is somebody's palace, then it's absolutely, it can be, you know, absentee owned kind of thing. It's a rental. Let's face it. Someone living there, they've been living there for years. I'm not going to pass judgment just because it doesn't look like I would want to live in it. And it's not slam slum lording, by the way. There's a difference between someone who willfully decides they want to live in a place that I wouldn't live and me causing something because I don't want to spend the money to maintain something and I'm requiring someone to live the way they do because of my greed. It has nothing to do with the fact that if they want to live there and I'm buying it, that doesn't make me a slam slum lord. But I would market it if it was a unit as a unit. If I chose and I thought, well, it's also something that would benefit a, a contractor investor. And a lot of times the benefit to the contractor investor, and this happens more times than you'd realize, is as cities go through and they rezone, and they typically rezone about every 10 years. So they'll go through and start rezoning. And what they'll do is they'll take a single family area and they'll convert it to an R2, R3, maybe an R4, basically R2, R3, R4. It, it starts make it allows multiple units per square foot. So like a residential single family, whatever the size of the lot is, only a single unit will be there. R2 in my area anyway, is I can put a house or dwelling 
every 3,000 square feet of the lot. So if I have a 7,000 square foot lot, I can put a duplex on it. If I have a single family house that is falling down, or I believe it could be falling down, I would market it as a single family on a duplex lot with space to build. And I would have two listings. So no big deal for the, the listing agent because if they only put it in as a single family, it will never show up on the search or the query if someone, and I said that word right, don't think I didn't say it right, that query if someone's looking for a lot and sometimes the structure of the that's there isn't va doesn't have any value, although the assessor may be assessing value. And if you buy something where the assessor is assessing value when literally there's no value or very limited value from a structure perspective, you want to have your, your property reassessed. But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't tear it down and I would I would continue to market or start marketing as both types land and property or land and uh, a dwelling. And uh, now if it's boarded up, it's absolutely been condemned. You've got to tear it down. You don't have any choice. Here's what you do. You do not call a contractor. Do not call a demolition contractor and have them come out. Okay. That's not the way to do it. At least that's not the way I would do it. So here's, here's a little secret. Here's a little hint. Call your fire department. They look for it always because of their training and all that kind of good stuff. They're look, they always are looking for houses that they can burn for training purposes. So call your fire department and say, I have a house that needs to be burnt down, blah, blah, blah. You'll, they'll sign the release for them or they'll sign, you'll, you'll sign it for them. They'll go out there and they'll burn the thing down. And then you call your, your demolition guy and have the foundation removed or the pier blocks or whatever the perimeter foundation, have that removed. But man, what a great thing. I mean, if you've got utilities on a, onto a lot, you've got water, you've got sewer, you've got gas and electricity already, whether the electricity is over, overhead or not, man, you've got some stuff there. I don't know if you've ever built a house or not, but it takes some time sometimes to get utilities in, um, installed. I mean, if, if you're on a, 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 a lot, let's assume that it's a, it's a single family resident lot in an established neighborhood. And when that neighborhood was uh, started, everybody was septic tank and overhead utilities for power. And of course you had water and, and gas underground, but, you know, since it was started, maybe they put a sewer line in, but they didn't tap your lot because it's, it was never, there was never a house there. So there's no sewer lateral going over there, man, you want to call those utility companies and order that stuff. As soon as you know that you're going to want to do that, you're wanting, wanting to build. And if you're an investor who buys a land, piece of property that's vacant or in that situation, you want to call and find out what those costs are, man. Is there any Miller Roos fees or any, any, any um, bonding issues, sometimes there's an, expense, there's an expense there of buying some of these houses or these lots where they haven't been, have sewer tapped in yet, but the sewer's in the street and it could be very, very expensive. So look at that kind of stuff. Sorry, getting off on that tangent. Question number two, I'll try to go faster. What are typical and unexpected expenses when you demo a house? What are typical and unexpected? Well, unexpected, I guess we could have the variety of, you know, the house blows up, there's damage to neighbors, all that kind of stuff, unexpected. I guess anything that you don't expect is unexpected. So that's a big question. What's typical on a demo of a house? Again, they're pretty simple. They're, you know, I, again, I wouldn't have a demo, demolition company come out and do it because I want the fire department to do it. Now the fire department, if they didn't do it, maybe there's a lot of asbestos in the property or what have you, then you're gonna have to have an asbestos contractor at least if in California, which is crazy, we have to have an asbestos contractor. They suit up, they do all kinds of stuff because asbestos will kill you and they extract it. And, um, I think in my state, if I'm not mistaken, and again, it, uh, I think it's a hundred square feet. If the house is asbestos and, and whatever you're doing to it isn't affecting more than a hundred square feet, you don't have to have asbestos commercially um, extracted or baited. But if you are, then you do. And so look at whatever that cost is, because if you're going to demolish the house and it's, it has asbestos, then you're going to have to have that checked. But, you know, find out you're, you're, you're paying taxes for your local fire department and they will absolutely inform you what needs to be done. So I, I would swear I'd call. Question number three, when you look at a property, how do you determine if a house fits the rehab model, the hotel model? It seems to me that all properties would fit the hotel model. They all fit the hotel model. They, let me say it one more time. They all fit the hotel model, okay? 
we are not contractors. Well, I'm a licensed general contractor, but we're not, typically we're not contractors, all right? We're investors, we're school teachers, we're doctors, we're attorneys, we're truck drivers, we're this person, we're that person. We're not contractors, okay, guys? We do not want to be at Home Depot every day picking up two by fours and, and toilets. Well, unless you like that stuff. If you like that stuff, by all means, Home Depot opens like at 530 in the morning. They'll, they'll gladly welcome you and some of them have coffee. But if you don't like that stuff, don't be a contractor. Buy a house in the as-is value, uh, at a percentage of as-is value. Market it as as-is value at 100%. Sell it to a, con uh, a contractor or an investor contractor who wants to go through the rehabbing. Some people actually like going through rehabbing. I don't get it. I guess there was a time I did too. But you know what? I realize there's no money in it. All you're doing is trading dollars. Now, the only time that I would get excited about a rehab, and I, you know, I'm currently I'm excited about a rehab. All right. So everything I just said, you know, Mike, you just lied. No, I didn't lie. There's every once in a while systems and rules change because other circumstances. Okay. So the circumstance that would cause me to get excited about a rehab, about going to Home Depot. And again, I would not go to Home Depot. I'd hire someone to go to Home Depot. But if the rehab was such that one, I could get into it and get out of it really fast. Two man weeks, I'm done in and out. Those big long rehabs that people are like remodeling, that's a bunch of crap. But if it was a quick rehab, in and out, two weeks, I'm done, easy. And my costs are minimal, my expectations are great. So I have an appraiser because we get appraisals. And the appraiser says, Man, as is as 100, but this neighborhood, if you spent another 10 or 20, you'd have a $180,000 house. I'd get excited about that because for 10,000 to make 80 minus the cost of 80, I know that's gonna be eight and a quarter. So, you know, I'm gonna have 6,500 minus the 10, 16,000 minus the 80. Well, heck, that's, you know, what is that? 64 grand more? And then I have to weigh that against you know, how long does it take me to make 64 buying and selling hotel houses? Well, if I only have one opportunity every three months, yeah, I'm going to be a rehabber. I'm going to be a fix and flipper. Absolutely. If that's all I have, I have to maximize my return. But if that's not all I had and I expect to buy more houses and not have that system or that mo business model, then I'm not going to do it. But there's every once in a while, I'll see a house and I'll go, man, I want to make I, my greed gets in the way. You know, we're all greedy. Greed's a good thing, by the way. I, I saw that in a movie. But um, and I actually believe it's a good thing. I think that's why we do some of the things and that's why we can help some of the people we help is because we want to make more money. Uh, greed's only bad when you take advantage of folks. So again, when the upside is so tremendous, you know, when you're looking at a three time, four time, five time multiplier of your investment, and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go back. And when the timetable is minimal, okay? That's, I think that's as a key component as the cost of the rehab. What is the cost of the time? How long is it going to take you to do this? So um, good question. We could talk about that one a lot. Thanks for listening to Buy, Sell, Fix, Flip. We'll be right back. Are you running out of leads? It's time you tried Yellow Letters at yellowletters.com. Get motivated seller leads through yellow letters, postcards, zip letters, typed professional letters, greeting cards, door hangers, and business cards. Yellow Letters is a full service marketing company created with your success in mind. Get the personal attention you need to get your direct mail campaign started and get in touch at yellowletters.com. And we are back in three, three, two, two, one. one. Question number four. I have a contract on a property. Congratulations that I thought I was getting a really great deal on. Oops, I'm thinking it's going to go bad now. But the BPO, BPO came in low. Should I trust what the one broker said and kick the deal or get an opinion of another broker? Well, that's a tough question. That's a really tough question. That's probably a question I ask myself a lot, you know, so as I oscillate between do I do this or do, do I do that? And the end of the day, I think we have to set systems in place, guidelines, turn them into reasonable guidelines. So as we set our systems and our guidelines, those are going to change because of, of experience. But at, once we know, well, this is what we're doing. 
And then we have, we have a situation where in order to accomplish what we emotionally want, we have to deviate from that system. So I've set a system in place. I say, I'm going to go home every day. I'm not going to stay at the office past five o'clock, no matter what. I'm not going to get to the office before nine o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to be at my office between nine and five. And someone calls me and says, hey, will you come out on a Saturday and look at my house and buy it? Hmm. And they go, but, and if you do, you can have a hundred thousand dollars extra. Hmm. Sounds very inviting. Now, if I had a system in place and it said, don't do it, no matter what, don't do it, then I wouldn't do it. If I had a system in place that said, if this occurs, then you can do this, then you can deviate. So my personal system is I don't, I, I'm not going to go out and see a house on weekends. Okay. After, after five, I'm not going to do it. Unless they say, hey, I know my house is worth 300000 and I'm willing to sell it to you for one hundred and fifty. Oh, and, and I can confirm that before I get there? Oh, well, yeah, I'm seeing you on a Saturday kind of thing. I'm not stupid. But let's, let's take this a little bit further. What if I didn't need the one hundred and fifty? What if it was like, yeah, it's still, the one hundred and fifty still isn't worth it to deviate from my system that I implemented? Well, let's take it backwards now. Let's go. Yeah, but I'm just talking about a BPL, Mike. Okay, get real here. It's not $150,000. We're talking about a BPO. Well, it's a system. We've implemented a system. Do we adhere to the system or do we deviate? Because if we're going to deviate from our systems, why have systems? Really? Okay. Why stop at the stop sign kind of thing? If you're not going to follow the rules that you've set in place for yourself, then don't have rules. Okay, and if someone says, well, your house is not worth what you thought it was and you're, you don't have any rules, yeah, go get another BPO. Go get 10 of them. What we can't do is justify what we think. That's why we, we have the system and the rule of the BPO and the appraisal. It's so that we are not emotionally attached to the, to the outcome. Because I can tell you what, I can, I can make a lot of houses more valuable. I can justify a bigger value. But that's not my system. My system is to get somebody else to justify value. And if it's in line, great. Now, do I think for a moment that I'm leaving money on the table by kicking a deal that doesn't fit within the system? Absolutely. I know that. I absolutely know that, but I also know that I'm kicking deals because I'm not going to go knock on doors. I also know that I'm, I'm kicking deals because I'm not doing lease options. I also know that I'm kicking deals because of whatever. I have a system. I have a plan. I'm following my system, my plan. If it deviates outside of that, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it because my systems are created in a way that causes me the maximum return for my time and my investment. The moment that we don't have systems or we allow our emotion to get in the way of our systems, then everything's going to go to crap. So your question, got a contract, really great deal. BPO came in low. What do you do? You have to ask yourself, what do you do? I wouldn't, I would say, Hey, you're kicking the deal. It didn't sit inside my system. My system said my first thing, the first thing I do, as a check and balance, besides trying to kick the deal internally, it got outside of my internal kick. It went to a BPO agent. They said, it's only worth this. My goodness, they're the professional. They're the ones that are seeing the property. I had never been to the property. And even if you have, they're seeing it from a different perspective. You're seeing it from me and I can make 50 grand on this house. They're saying, seeing it from, how do I sell this house? Which is really what you need to do because you don't make any money until you sell them. Okay. Unless you're a passive income earner. Yeah. But you still have that same thing. You still have to say, can I rent it? Can, you know, and, and I think I can rent it for a thousand and then your property manager says, no, I can get 600. Well, don't, don't go to another property manager just because another one says well, I can get you 1200. No, go to the one that said I can get you six, because if that's what you can count on, you can always count on the lower number. You can never always count on the higher number. And so, you know, if, if, if the BPO comes in lower than you expected, that's just what you did. So you do more marketing, you answer more phone calls, make more contracts, 
And at the end of the day, you're going to have really good contracts that are performing for you instead of all these little itty bitty things, Mike. And a, a half a loaf of bread is better than no loaf of bread. No, it's not. Okay? Because it's taking you away from doing the real deal. It's like being in love halfway. Well, I don't really love her, but she's the only one I have, so I'm going to ask her to marry me, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life with her. I don't really love her, but I'm, I, I haven't found anybody else to love. Well, th- whatever. Go get, go get a contract that, that, that sits inside your system. Honor your system. If it falls out, that's great. Just go get another contract. That's all it is. Don't make things happen. Don't sharpen that pencil. That's not the business we're in. Okay, we have a dull pencil. We can't sharpen it. Question number five. I've gotten two calls this week from people who already have the house listed with an agent. What do I tell them? This is a great question. There's a couple angles that we can take here. Ethically, I'll start off in saying we should never, ever impede on the performance of the contract or the listing agreement. So someone calls you up and says, hey, I got my house listed and you can, you can, if you like, it's up to you. I would never do this. Well, if you can call your agent, if you have them cancel it, I'm, uh, or, or is it, if it, when it gets expired kind of stuff, you know, convince them how to do this. Oh, just call the broker and say your agent's not returning their phone call, your phone calls. The, if you call the, cause the broker enough hassles, they'll, they'll cancel the listing for you. And then I'll buy your house. Well, that's a bunch of crap. Don't do it that way. So if someone calls me, calls me and says, hey, my house is listed with a real estate professional and their name is XYZ and their phone number is 123. I'll say, you know, at this moment, we're not, ta- we're not buying property. They're list- currently listed. If your house somehow becomes unlisted, please give me a call back so I can set a time to come out and buy it. I am not going to teach or educate someone on how to unlist a property not my job. Ethically, it's not my job. Legally, it's probably not my job either because you can be held responsible for interfering with someone's right to, to um, sell a piece of property. Most people don't realize there's a law in the books and who's going to enforce it because probably the broker doesn't want to um, have that social media advertising. However, some brokers out there will actually use you as an um, example. But at the end of the day, would I want it to be done to me? If, if I had an agreement to buy a house, would I want another investor to tell a seller, well, you know, you can cancel it. They didn't do this right. They didn't dot that, T, that I. They didn't cross that T. This is blah, blah, blah. No, that, that, no. So if I wouldn't want it done to me, why would I want to attempt it to, to do it to anybody else? So I just say, hey, great. If it ever becomes unlisted or expired, or expired and you can't sell it, give me a call back. I don't convince them. Now, let's assume for a second, Mike, I don't have anything to do. My marketing's not working the way I wanted it to work. And I'm getting these calls, and these are the only calls I'm getting. Now, I have only bought one property through the multiple listing service, and I'm a broker. So I have advantages and access to the multiple listing service. I don't believe for a moment that there are, there are good deals on a repetitive basis, the one that, a repetitive basis that I can control. I know there are good deals there, absolutely. And if you don't have anything else to do, start looking at your multiple listing service, look for 180 day listings and see how those, what those look like, okay? There's, they're gonna expire, they're not sold. Now, sometimes they don't wanna be sold, sometimes the people just are listing it because they legally have to try to, uh, quote unquote, attempt to sell it in a, in a divorce situation or something like that or a probate situation. Uh, but they don't really want to sell it, so they list it so high it's never going to sell, or they're not really motivated, or they want more for their property than it's worth, and their listing agent was too weak and couldn't convince them of the listing it at the right price. But some of them actually do want to sell their house. And um, so if you don't have anything to do, that might be an area that you want to look at. But if someone, if I didn't have anything else to do, and I would probably ask the agent, if I, or a seller who called me and they said their house was listed, I'd ask the seller for the agent's information. I'd call XYZ agent and I'd ask them this question. Are you open to having me present the seller an offer directly? If they say no, and most likely they'll say no. No, you can't do that. I have a listing. I'm the listing agent. Well, boo-hoo to that. I don't know what that means to you. What it means to me is that you're not willing 
for me to present my own offer because I know I can present my offer better than most real estate agents. So let's look, let's magnify this process that the agent went through in the first place to get this listing. Okay. So Mr. and Mrs. Seller call a real estate agent out. Yeah, we want to list our house, whatever it is. The agent goes out there prior to going out there. They do a CMA comparative market analysis. They meet with the seller and they say, your house is worth a hundred cents on the dollar. And my cost is only 6%. And you have all these, a couple other things, and there'll be some work requirements. And if you can move some of this stuff out of your house and blah, blah, whatever it is. So they're going to convince the seller that their house is worth a hundred cents on the dollar. House is going to sit on the market. Go sit on the market. Seller's going to call. I haven't talked to you. How's the market going? The, sell, the agent's going to say, hey, maybe we need a little price reduction. They're going to get a little price reduction. They're going to get like, let's, let's lower it $3,000. Well, what is a $3,000 price reduction? Anyway, so they're going to get a little price reduction. It's going to sit on the market. So now they're 97 cents on the dollar. And um, of the original thought of the agent, and so it's not selling. So they get my letter in the mail. The seller does, hey, I got someone that wants to buy my house. Uh, they, they need to call my agent or they give my information to the agent. The agent calls me directly. Well, how am I going to write an offer through that real estate professional who convinced the seller originally to sell their house at 100 cents on the dollar, a 60 cent on the dollar offer? How am I going to do that? How? So here's the conversation the seller, the agent has with the seller. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, remember back when, two months ago, when I took your listing and I said you could have 100 cents on the dollar? I was wrong. Looks like the only offers we're getting it there at 60 cents on the dollar. No, the agent's not going to do that because it's going to make them look bad. Very few agents are going to be honest with their, their, their sellers. And if they were honest, they wouldn't have given this 100 cents on the dollar offer or, or ask on the first time, the first place. So I, I know that I can't have my, an agent represent my offer correctly because I can represent my offer. I can talk to the seller about saying, the nice thing about my offer, we're buying as is, we're gonna have your money on the day of your choice, we're covering all the costs, I know you have it listed, and blah, 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 blah. And I can communicate why my program is better than waiting for a buyer at 97 cents or 100 cents that hasn't arrived yet. I can do that. But the agent can't. The agent's protecting their ego. Their ego says, I told them it was worth 100 cents. And I have to justify that. I can't, I can't convince them to sell less. And then let's assume for a second they could. Maybe they knew, maybe they had this seller in their back pocket and they knew that if they were on the market for 60 days, at some point the seller's gonna go down to 60 cents on the dollar. Do you think for a moment they're gonna present your offer to them? Well, like they legally have to. No, they don't. They can get the, the seller to sign a waiver that they're not going to take any offers less than full value. And then you're dead. But what did you just convince the, sell, the, the agent to do? If you say, hey, you know, here's my 60 cent offer and they talked to the seller about it. And, and the seller said, yeah, I'll take 60 cents on the dollar. And then the, sell, the agent comes back to you and says, no, the seller doesn't want to see any low ball offers. And I got this form signed to prove it, blah, 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 blah. What are they going to do? Do you think for a moment they may go ahead and write their own offer on that house at 60 cents on the dollar? Because they think it's worth 100 cents. They've seen it. They know more about the house than you do. Second to the seller, they, they're the one that knows everything about the house. So I would want to make sure that I was there to present my offer. Now, in the, the realtor status industry, you know, they're brokers and their agents, and then they, if they belong to the club called Realtors, they can be a Realtor, but they don't have to be. But if they are a Realtor, a Realtor can request that the, the listing Realtor, so a buyer's agent selling Realtor, can request from the listing Realtor the right to present the offer. But not you, the right, their right to present the offer to the, the seller that's represented by the listing agent. Now, again, the listing agent can say, no, I have this form signed by the seller who says they only want me to. And then that doesn't work. But there are times that a realtor can present their own offer. But I know very few realtors who understand how we buy houses and can present an offer the way we need to have the offer presented. So again, Someone calls me up, my house is listed. Great, when it becomes unlisted or expired. 
please give me a call. I'm not going to convince them, not going to teach them about the difference between a canceled listing and a withdrawn listing. None of that kind of stuff. I'm not going to teach them about, you know, um, don't talk to me about your house. Let's not talk about your house because it is. Then you could be obligated to pay that agent a commission even 120 days after the listing expires because we started to negotiate. I'm not going to say any of those things. So I'm not even going to get involved in it. I just say, call me back when it becomes unlisted or expired. Something happens and you can just still want to sell. Call me back. If I wasn't really busy, yeah, maybe I would ask the agent um, if they would allow me to present my own offer. If they would, maybe I would. But let's let's face it. And I know agents that are listening to this are going to get mad at me. I apologize in advance. A lot of agents, the only thing they're good for is marketing. So. Now, there's a lot of agents that are much better than that. And you kind of know who you are if you're better than that because you deal with the ones that they're just, they're just advertising agents. What I mean by that, they have access to the MLS, so they dump property on the MLS, and that's all they're good for. That's all you're hiring them for because they're, you know, I can do the paperwork, uh, uh, and so I don't need them to do the paperwork. I just need that MLS access. So if that's all I'm getting, that's all they're good for. So that's all the, their fee is a marketing dollar. And I, I attribute a marketing dollar to every transaction. And so I just have to take their marketing dollar away from what I would offer. And, you know, that's it. So it's going to be a lower offer to the seller. And that's okay. But make sure you can present the offer yourself. The long podcast. I apologize, everybody. So remember, we've got over at Yellow Letters, they have the Platinum Member Card. $147 gets you 15% off on all of your orders. First time you spend a thousand bucks, and a lot of you do, you, it pays for the card. And no, you cannot use it the same day you buy the card. So we, you buy the card, they mail it to you. It looks like a credit card coming in the mail with a number on it. The next time you order, then you can use that. So your first order is a regular price. Second order is gonna be discounted, of course. And um, continue marketing for January and gonna be exciting stuff coming on a podcast. I appreciate everything you guys allow me to do. And I get a kick out of it. This is like going on vacation every day when I sit in front of this microphone, put the headset on, and go through these, these questions. I appreciate it. Talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.